On this week's Career Wrap, we speak with Gunter Ortendorfer, who's the CEO of Technology at Sprint, to discuss the carrier's recent 5G technology testing and deployment plans. All right. Well, uh, hey, thanks for joining us on this week's Carrier Wrap. Uh, I'm your host, Dan Meyer, Editor-in-Chief here at RCR Wireless News. And this week, we are joined by uh, Gunther Otendorfer, who's the uh, CT- COO of technology at Sprint, to talk a bit about uh, 5G. So, Gunther, thanks so much for joining us this week. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. I'm very happy to talk with you about this topic because um, we are still very excited. Yesterday, there was the big final of the Copa America Centenario. And uh, as you might remember, we kicked it off with uh, our 5G demonstration in Santa Clara, which was a great success. And uh, it was uh, the first uh, worldwide public um, 5G demonstration in such a big setting. So we had uh, over the course of the days uh, in Santa Clara and in Philadelphia, more than 200,000 people uh, that visited those games and saw our 5G demo. So we are very excited about it. and. Um, we are also very excited that it gave us the opportunity to showcase to people what 5G could do because we had on our stand, I think, a pretty impressive uh, virtual reality demo via 5G. And uh, yeah, so it's great uh, to, to have that. And we will keep on going on that journey. Very good. Yeah, and I know some of those demonstrations, you guys were using a lot of uh, some of the millimeter wave, centimeter wave spectrum bands as well, which I know a lot of people talk about 5G. That's a big part of it. Uh, I guess, can you, can you describe a little bit about what was part of these demonstrations? I know people are still uh, not quite sure what 5G means, and we'll, you know, obviously there's standards and stuff to work there, but, but I guess what you guys were doing in terms of kind of the demonstrations there. Yes, so uh, in our demonstrations, we used uh, uh, in Santa Clara uh, 73 gigahertz and we used in Philadelphia 15 gigahertz. So obviously that's very high band spectrum. And um, we were happy to see that spectrum working in real life environment. We had um, no safety net. This was a live demonstration. It was all real time and it worked very well. We have seen there uh, speeds, peak speeds of more than two and more than four gigabits per second. Uh, and we have seen very low latency in the one to two millisecond range. So that is all very encouraging for the development uh, of 5G. Obviously, 5G is in the early days. We are also engaged in the standardization and we know that the plan for 5G is to be commercially really broadly available around 2020. But it is important uh, to start this development now. Our experience with high band spectrum in Sprint is a very extensive one. We use, as you know, on our network uh, as the workhorse 2.5 uh, gigahertz spectrum, and we have plenty of that. And uh, that spectrum is considered to be the low band for 5G. So the five band spectrum will be higher than that. That's why we made the trials on 15 and 73, which basically is probably the mid band and then the high band of 5G spectrum in the future. And um, we have experience with that. We are actively working in the ITU and 3GPP on the standardization of 5G. We are pushing that forward. And beside that, we have practical experience because we have done in the past, not only the 2.5, where we get experience with high band, but we also have uh, thousands of cell sites uh, currently already that have backhaul via microwave in millimeter wave spectrum. And uh, so we have experience in 11 gigahertz, 18 gigahertz, 23 gigahertz, uh, 28 gigahertz, and then 80 gigahertz spectrum. And all of that came nicely together for our de- demonstrations uh, in that area. And uh, I'm happy with the results. And uh, as we said, it's the beginning of a journey and uh, we will continue to walk on that path. Very good. Yeah. So I guess overall then those high band spectrum bands, because again, people always were, there's always a little concern about the propagation characteristics of those. But for the most part, uh, at least in the trials you guys were showing, uh, so far so good in terms of how those things were able to operate and, and be able to transmit uh, data uh, over obviously short, short, you know, short areas, but still being able to, to transmit the data there. Yes, and, and that's where it's really important. For example, uh, in uh, New York, we have an 18 gigahertz microwave 
uh, network. Mm -hmm. And so we have all the practical experience. It has been operating over the last years. We have all the experience with different weather conditions, with fog, with rain. Uh, we have uh, experience in running in a real life environment. And we see that if you uh, respect certain <laughs> conditions for that spectrum, it works quite well. And uh, the second big aspect to this is with the 2.5 spectrum, we have a spectrum that is already high band today. You know that we uh, have uh, managed the traffic growth uh, over the last years on that spectrum. With LT Plus, as you can see behind me, uh, we have activated carrier aggregation and beam forming uh, on the 2.5. And both technologies will be integral uh, building blocks for 5G. So we believe that not only we have a really good experience with high band spectrum, we also have really good experience with the functionalities that will be building blocks for 5G. Very good. Yeah. And obviously, for, as part of this too, it's going to require a lot of uh, a different deployment methods. Obviously, small cells are going to be a big part of this. I know you guys are working a lot with the small cell uh, community there to get a lot of that stuff out there. Uh, I guess you can talk a bit about the importance of that experience you guys are getting with small cells. Because again, you know, as you work with 15 or 73 or 80 gigahertz spectrum, uh, it's really going to require that uh, expertise, it seems like, in, in the deployment of small cells and microwave backhaul and things like that too. Uh, I guess you can talk a bit about the importance of, of small cells for your, for your plans moving forward. Yes, uh, as you said, uh, it will be really, really the key for successful 5G deployment to have uh, a, a different rollout strategy than we had in the past. We believe that with our identification and optimization strategy, we have already the right foundation for that. Because we are building structures today that we use for LTE, but we can then they are already optimal uh, for the 5G world. And that's why we put so much uh, planning into our densification and optimization strategy. That's also why, uh, you know, we, there, there was a lot of speculation and rumors about our strategy. It is a little bit different than uh, other carriers are doing, but we do it with uh, our site already on 5G. We want to build those structures, not only for today, we want to be future-proof. And I think to be future-proof, you need a small cell strategy. You need the ability to do densification on very um, on a big variety of uh, cell structures, not only classical uh, macro towers. You need also pole attachments. You will need femtocells. You need small cells. You need repeaters to uh, handle all that traffic that will be coming in the 5G network. 5G is about massive densification. Uh, it is about um, high bandwidth spectrum. And we have seen also that uh, last week, uh, especially the FCC um, made their big push to 5G. I think that is very well aligned with our strategy. It is about high band spectrum for us, the 2.5 as a start. It is about uh, having easier access to infrastructure, that is our densification and optimization strategy. And then it is about of having the ability uh, to have back home. So this is kind of a three legged stool. And I think we at Sprint have done, uh, have prepared ourselves very well for all three legs of that stool. That makes sense, makes sense. And obviously to you guys, like you said, rely a lot on the 2.5 spectrum today and obviously going forward as well. And even today though, you guys, you know, you have so much to play with there. You're only using a, a relatively small slice of it even today and are getting some pretty robust speeds in a lot of markets. Uh, I guess you talk a bit about are there other plans to eventually roll out more and more uh, channels for 2.5 or what's kind of the 2.5 plan in terms of your current uh, LTE plus strategy, but then also moving towards uh, whatever 5G is going to be as well. Yes, so that is a very good question. I think um, we, we have with LT Plus, where we have uh, so far two carrier aggregation, created a really good foundation. We had also the, showcased uh, the capabilities of the Samsung, uh, uh, Samsung S7 device that has three carrier aggregation. In our labs, we achieved speeds uh, of more than 300 megabits per second, I think back, back in April. Yep. And, um, that really shows what is possible. So we are now, uh, well over the next years, have the ability to, to turn on further chunks of our spectrum. And by that increasing, uh, not only the top speed, but also the capacity of our network. And with that, the reliability of our network. So I believe from that perspective, Sprint has really uh, 
not only a great foundation, but a great opportunity to handle the data waves of the future. And um, we, we, we love to say, you ain't seen nothing yet. We have this capability, we will deploy it, and it will be very beneficial for our customers and uh, their data needs. And we are also um, cooperating uh, with our vendors to really get ready for that world. And uh, it will be then, uh, as a next step, three carrier aggregation, but then there will be also four carrier aggregation, and one day there might be also five carrier aggregation. That makes sense, makes sense. Obviously, too, as you're working through some of these trials, I know with the one in, uh, in Santa Clara, I think you worked with uh, Nokia on that one, and I believe Ericsson uh, in Philadelphia, too. So obviously, the vendor support is big for all of this. Uh, I guess, can you talk a bit about the importance of those vendors being on board with this and, and how helpful uh, they've been for this? Because obviously, it does seem like operators are trying to move, obviously, towards 5G, and you got to have the vendors out there to help you as well. How important is that, uh, that working with them? them had, how, part, how important has that been for you guys? It is um, very important for us uh, because we can only develop this ecosystem together. Yeah. And I think what we have seen uh, from the vendor side is a big commitment to 5G. We have uh, seen in these demonstrations really great efforts from Nokia and Ericsson. Uh, they have been doing very innovative work uh, around all kinds of the ecosystem. Ericsson is doing very innovative stuff around modular 5G equipment a lot. Uh, around Internet of Things. Nokia has demonstrated in Japan recently uh, wireless 8K video transmission. So both of them are trying to push the limits further. It's an evolutionary process where operators and uh, system suppliers have to work together. And we have been very happy what we have seen in those, particularly in those demonstrations with both of them. Got it. Okay. And obviously, too, I know your, your equipment, you guys, you guys have done a lot of work over the past, you know, five years or so on upgrading your network as well. So it does seem like the network itself should have uh, the capabilities somewhat embedded in the system now to really be able to roll out this additional support for whether it's 5G or just even more carriers uh, on the 2.5 band as well. It seems like the network is kind of really ready for this next evolution there, what you guys are looking, planning to do. Well, um, I, I would put it that way. Uh, you need um, all these, uh, we, we talked before about the three-legged stool, you need all three legs. So we think we are ready because we have the spectrum, we are building the structure, and we are having the backhaul. Yeah. Uh, but you need all of those three legs. Otherwise, if you have two less spectrum, it will be very hard to fulfill uh, th that data growth uh, uh, that we expect with 5G. So uh, it is uh, an interesting task to get ready for it. But uh, with LT Plus, we certainly made a, a real good step into that direction, activating the spectrum and also implementing the functionality early. That gives us the capability to learn how to best use and fine tune uh, the functionalities of the future. Yeah, that's a good point. And it doesn't make, I mean, people keep talking about this move towards 5G as being a very uh, evolutionary type of, or revolution type of, uh, you know, network enhancement. But uh, it does seem like some operators are, are still, uh, you know, looking to kind of keep their older legacy system as being a, a big part of that. But to really make this change, though, you really do need to kind of rethink how the network is going to work. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe currently you guys might be getting some, uh, maybe some heat for the fact that you guys are looking forward like that. But to really kind of support what's coming down the road, you, you kind of really need to rethink these, these deployments. And so uh, it does seem like, you know, while it might be a little, you know, challenging today, uh, it's kind of like laying the groundwork for what needs to kind of happen, really. I agree 100%. So I, I believe some of the things we are doing are really pioneering efforts for 5G. And um, as with many of the pioneering efforts, there is some heat and some pain associated with it. And that's why we are also... Um, very much um, um, focusing on making clear it's an evolution of an existing network. Yeah. So everything we build now is making our network even better. And you know that we were recently uh, winning a lot of, the, for example, the Root Metrics Award that we have very good uh, benchmarks with Nielsen. We are building on that. We are making it even better. It's not about doing something new. It's about refining what we have. And the approach we have taken, and especially our small, small cell approach, is very innovative. It is, uh, we, we are pioneers with that. So being a pioneer has some risks, uh, but uh, I, I think if you have a good logic, uh, walk your path uh, with continuity, um, then you will also reap big benefits out of that. And we are also, all the things we are doing are really very much aligned with the strategy 
uh, the FCC chairman put out last week, he's talking about exactly the same thing. Having the high band spectrum, having the right infrastructure in place will be key ingredients uh, for America to have to be a leader in the 5G world. And that's what we want for the industry and that's what we want for Sprint. Obviously, too. And like you said, too, it is kind of all being built on the current network. You know, I know people ask me sometimes, you know, is, does 5G mean that we're getting, you know, beyond LTE? But LTE is going to be kind of the base layer for everything that we kind of do moving forward. I mean, there was so much work put into deploying these LTE networks, you know, all IP based and everything, that there's no need to get rid of that. And that's, that's a great base layer. And just building 5G on top of that, like you said, is an enhancement to kind of what's already been, been put out there to this point. I agree. And uh, it, it will be a situation where you have uh, with 5G added um, capabilities. So the, the, the world of opportunities will get even bigger for mobile operators, especially if we think about things like narrowband IoT and those uh, capabilities that 5G will bring. But it's an enhancement. It will build on the things that are already there. And so I'm really positive that with the LT Plus strategy, that foundation will uh, continuously support us even then when we start 5G, it will be the right uh, structure we have in place. That makes sense. Now, I guess, are you guys doing much work? I, I, I get a lot of people asking a lot about kind of the virtualization moves towards SD and NFE. And, you know, I, I know the telecom market loves acronyms. And so every time we can get a new acronym out there, it's always great. Uh, are you guys doing much work, I guess, uh, towards using virtualization platforms as you look towards your 5G plans? Because it does seem like you're really going to need a lot of automation in, in the network and a lot of things to really handle what's going to be various spectrum bands and all these new use cases. Uh, is that a big part of what you guys are looking to do uh, rolling forward as well? Yes. So we, we are spending a good uh, deal of work on that, but it's kind of behind the scenes work. So we are, we are testing different solutions. We are getting, well, one of the big things uh, with NFE is it's a real paradigm shift for the telecom industry. And so what we are doing is we are tackling it uh, first with our technical people. We are trying to get everyone on that journey. We are trying to get our teams ready. We do not rush into deployments because we believe uh, that it will be a, a, a smooth transition process, a gradual transition process over time. And so we are getting ready. My experience, for example, with Telecom Austria Group is very positive. We uh, did uh, uh, about a year or two ago the first fully virtualized stack in Serbia. Uh, and the, the, all the experiences I had there were very positive about uh, implementing an NFE stack, about uh, operating it, planning for it, and running it in parallel with the legacy hardware you had. And so I think building on those experiences, uh, what we do here is first to get the team ready to start that journey with our people and building out the capabilities, building out a different mindset for that world. And then we will go and gradually uh, increase the level of deployment in our network. Yeah, that makes sense too. And again, the timing part of it does make sense because you know it does seem like when it comes to the software world, you know, there's so the evolution is happening so rapidly. I mean, every six months, you know, big advances are happening out there. So yeah, there is there is no reason it seems like at this point to really rush too far into it because it is evolving at such a rapid pace that six months from now it could be a totally different uh, platform out there for the most part. So you kind of need to be ready for it, but not uh, not jump too quickly into it. And then that is the key point. You need to be ready for it because I believe with the coming second and third uh, wave of data growth we will see, that will put enormous stress on our networks. First, we will feel it uh, on the radio side. That's why further high band spectrum is so important for the mobile industry. Uh, that's why we, I'm also very happy about the 2.5 gigahertz spectrum we have because we will activate that to uh, surf those data waves. But then to surf those data waves in the core, uh, we will need NFE technology because there is no way, no other way that gives you the flexibility and the utilization that NFE does. So we are getting ready for it. Uh, and we, we know that this wave is coming and we will be ready at Sprint. Makes sense. Okay, well, I guess maybe one final wrap-up question, I guess for Sprint moving ahead, obviously you've had two great trials you are doing the 5G technology uh, connected with the soccer tournament. I guess what's, what's next for you guys when you look forward a little bit in terms of your, your 5G movements? Is it, again, just more trialing and stuff, or I guess what do you guys see as being your next, next kind of advancement there? Well, uh, as you know, the, uh, we, we talked about it a little bit in the beginning. The time frame for 5G is around 2020. Okay. So for the next years, it will be around uh, 
trialing, improving, enhancing technology, testing new functionality, adding on functionality. Very much that will be the focus. But um, other than that, our focus will be the densification and optimization strategy, building the structures that are 5G ready, building a, a future-proof network, and uh, then it's about uh, further steps in our LTE Plus network so that we have the capacity for our existing and new customers and delivering really good and reliable services for them and surfing those data waves. And with all uh, these foundations we have laid out, you ain't seen nothing yet. Very good, way, good. We definitely appreciate the insight on this. Obviously, like you said, you guys are doing a lot of work in terms of 5G. Uh, everybody loves talking about 5G, but you guys are definitely pushing it pretty heavy. So uh, we definitely appreciate you getting inside on the topic today. Thanks so much for your time. And uh, hopefully we'll touch base again soon as you guys continue this, this uh, path down the 5G world. Well, thanks for watching this week's show and make sure to check us out again next week when we are scheduled to speak with Bravado Networks on its first net plans.